I will uh, proceed to tell you about astronomy in Botswana from the point of view of uh, this Englishman who's had the privilege to visit Botswana a lot over the last few years. Um, and uh, for those people in, uh, who are in Botswana, I will direct the first part of the talk to the UK audience and tell them things about Botswana. So some of the uh, participants today will know more about Botswana than I do. So uh, uh, apologies for that. But um, I've, I've uh, also uh, titled this Dark Skies and Bright Prospects. And you'll see why, I hope. So here's a, an outline of the, the talk. I'm going to introduce Botswana to those people who are not familiar with uh, the country, with some facts and figures. And then I've had the, uh, the privilege to um, spend some time in uh, Botswana as a tourist. And I'll give you a tourist side view. I want to go with the family, like all of us, my the children, Shannon and... Um, can I, could I ask... Could I ask... And I don't know, we're just not coming to the can I ask Zara to um, mute, please? Okay. Um, and then go on to the meat of the talk, which is astronomy in Botswana. Uh, I'll talk about the advent of the Astronomical Society and then uh, go on to the ambitious projects that are uh, being fostered in Botswana, major astronomical projects as part of international consortia, for example. And then inevitably I'll give some concluding remarks. So, first of all, where is Botswana? For those people who are in Botswana at the moment, you know very well where Botswana is. Um, but I have to say, when I uh, first took up the visiting professorship at, uh, the, at Bust, one of the two universities I'll, I'll speak about later on in the talk, I was talking to the head of the physics department at the University of Oxford over the phone. And I told him I was going to Botswana. And, I, and he said, oh, Botswana. Um, and I knew he was looking it up on Google. And he said, it's big, isn't it? And I said, oh, yes, yes, it's a big country. Um, anyway, it sits, as you can see here in Southern Africa, um, with Namibia to the west and South Africa to the south. Um, and uh, you can see on this map here, Zimbabwe to the northeast and Zambia to the north and Angola to the northwest. Um, on this map, I point to Khabarone, which is the capital, which is right on the South African border, where I spent a lot of my time in the, uh, I spent six months out there about three years ago and I've been back regularly since, sadly not in the last 12 months, but, um, uh, and I go mainly to Bust, this university I'll talk about a little bit later on, which is uh, in Palapi, which is not actually on this map for some reason, but is very near to this town called Soroe. As a tourist, I've visited the Okavango Delta and the Chobe National Park, also spent New Year at Victoria Falls and several other places, which again, I'll tell you about briefly later on. So you got a flavor of, of the country. Some facts and figures. It is a big country. In land area, it's slightly larger than France. However, in uh, population of 2.3 million, that is less than the population of the greater Manchester area. So it's a large country with a relatively small population. So the population density is low. And that's important for astronomy, as I'm sure you can uh, realize very quickly, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. It is not a really poor country. It's a middle income country these days. The revolution in, uh, in the uh, uh, standard of living in Botswana has been dramatic since the 1960s, where it was one of the poorest countries in the world. And just after it gained independence, 
um, diamonds were discovered and the wealth was shared among the population in a, a very benevolent way. It's a democratic country. It's been democratic ever since then. Um, and it's been a country showing one of the strongest growths of any economy in the world. Um, now, what is that based on? Agriculture is still important. Tourism is very important, but minerals and particularly diamonds are incredibly important. I think Botswana and Russia are the two major producers of diamonds in the world. It's a very, very stable and peaceful country. I mean, the murder rate, if that's a measure of uh, how peaceful a country is, is lower than it is in the UK. Um, and uh, it is a, a very safe country to visit. So um, it has major universities, the University of Botswana, which is in the capital of Haberoni, and the Botswana International University of Science and Technology, which, as I said before, is at Bust. Uh, in Palapi, uh, it's Bust in Palapi rather, um, and uh, I will uh, say a little bit more about that, and that's uh, where I was um, approached by uh, a former PhD student of mine in, in Liverpool, um, who uh, was a lecturer in astronomy in uh, Bust, to see whether I would uh, like to spend uh, six months, three years, or five years uh, as a visiting professor in uh, in Botswana and so I spent an initial six months and then I'm now part-time uh, at a distance obviously uh, on a three-year contract with them so which has been absolutely superb so on the end of uh, some of those uh, visits I've been able to take my wife along and we've uh, done the touristy things Botswana has about a third, maybe even a half, certainly about a third of the elephants in the whole of Africa. It has a, a, a relatively large and well-protected rhino population. Um, through a, a friend of ours, um, Harold Hester, um, who's on the Zoom tonight, actually, um, we uh, were able to go on a Makoro Rip into the Okavango Delta, and that's my wife on a Makoro, which is a originally these are dugout canoes that are poled along like a Cambridge punt, except in this case you're going along channels formed by hippopotamuses. And occasionally, as they did to us, they surface in front of you, uh, which is pretty scary. You, you're not going to go any further when that happens. Um, uh, there are crocodiles around and so on, but we camped for three days uh, out in the delta. Um, and during the mornings, before it got too hot, we walked out with two guides out into the uh, onto the islands. And uh, there'd be a guide behind us and the guide in front, and myself and Jill in the middle. And I remember when we first set out, we had heard lions in the distance, and I thought, well. Um, I know that uh, our lead guide hasn't got any weapon, but the one behind us must have a weapon. And I turned around, he hadn't even got a stick. And we walked for three hours out there and we actually stumbled across uh, a herd of uh, um, water buffalo, which are uh, some of the most dangerous animals in, uh, in the bush. And uh, we backed off and luckily they didn't take any more notice. So uh, we're still here to tell the tale. Um, then we got back to our lodge. Eventually we were in tents on the island, but we got back to the lodge and just looking out from the lodge into the very calm waters of a pool in front of us, we saw this beady eye, which is actually a crocodile in the, uh, in the pool in front of us. We went up to Chobe National Park and took uh, water safaris there full of hippos, see the crocodile on the right hand side, and lots and lots of elephants. So this is just a short movie of one of those small, a small herd of elephants with a lone male trying to join the herd and getting uh, chased away. Um, 
And that's my wife who's uh, talking to the elephants. <laughs> yeah. So just over to the right hand side was a crocodile, by the way. So uh, uh, this is um, just over the border in uh, Medikwe, over the South African border at Medikwe, where there's a hide at the at eye level of a waterhole, and you look up, and you can look up towards the eyes of an elephant, for example. Um, there are both the white uh, rhino and the black rhino, that's the black rhino. Uh, we also went to Namibia, to Africat in Namibia. We walked within about 20 yards of that pair of brothers, cheetahs, and you could hear them purring. The leopard there with the collar on walked right past our vehicle and I, he was so close I could hear his paws hitting the ground. This is a leopard up a tree, uh, again back in Medikwe, which is about an hour from the centre of Haberoni. Uh, and this is uh, again in Medikwe, this is a pair of brothers, lions, that walked right past our vehicle and uh, like if I'd reached, if I'd been foolish enough to reach my hand out, uh, I could have touched him very easily. But they, uh, it's amazing, they just don't recognize humans sitting in vehicles. They ignore them, thank goodness. Um, if you stood up, it'd be a different matter. Let's, uh, okay, let's move on. Um, I spent most of my time in Palapi at Bust. Uh, Palapi is somewhere that those of you have seen the film A United Kingdom, which features some of the life story of the first president of Botswana, Saretsi Kama. Um, it uh, was filmed in Palapi, uh, a lot of it was anyway, and uh, uh, some of it's in the Palapi Hotel. And then Habaroni, um, oh, nearby to uh, Palapi is the Kama Rhino Reserve. Uh, and that's a rhino that came down to drink out of the children's paddling pool. So you can see my father's expression. This is the University of Botswana campus. Um, and I used to uh, play tennis at the uh, Haberoni Club. And in the background there is a herd of cows, which would turn up sometimes at the club, which is something we don't find at the uh, tennis club here in Williston very often. And when I opened the bank account, um, by opening this bank account, I was entered into a draw to win a book. And I just wondered how I was going to get that back to England on the plane. Um, unfortunately, I didn't win the ball. But, uh, somebody must have done. Can, can I just ask people who have joined to mute the microphones, please? We, we can all hear you. Hello? Uh, it's okay. Can you can you hear me okay? By the way, Rick, is that? Yes, I can. I can hear somebody's interrupting, and I just can't see uh, anywhere because I've got your screen loaded up. Okay. So I can't. Them. All I can do is ask them to mute if they can hear me. <laughs> okay. Right. So. Um, I was spending my time between Palapi, which uh, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but it's up here. Um, and it's along the railway line, which was built by uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes in his grand scheme to link Cape Town and Cairo. I didn't get much further than this, but, uh, 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 and I would drive to meetings and so on down in the capital, Haberoni down here. And in so doing, I'd be crossing, Tropic of Capricorn. So, um, and this links us now to astronomy at last. So that hopefully gives those of you who don't know Botswana particularly a bit of a flavor of the country, a very friendly country, a country where you can see more in the way of wildlife than many countries in the world. In fact, on one day in Medikwe, uh, we saw all the big five in one day and some of the other rare animals too. So um, why Botswana? Clear skies, it's relatively high. It doesn't have high mountains, but it is, the whole country is relatively high, probably an average of about a thousand meters. 
Population density is very low, so you get very low light pollution. Its geographical position is interesting, and we'll say more about that uh, in a moment. It's a stable and trustworthy country, as I've said before. And there's also a traditional affinity with the skies from the, the people who've lived there for many generations. This is a map of the world showing average cloud cover. Um, and this is from a NASA satellite taking 13 years of data, looking at the whole Earth. And you'll see Botswana is down in this sort of region. Um, and the map zooming in, the, the coast here is uh, the coast of Namibia, which gets fogs and clouds. But if you come inland to Botswana, you'll see it's actually one of the clearer parts of the world. The clearest part of the world is probably here in North Africa, in the deserts of North Africa and Saudi Arabia, and also along the coast here in Chile. But uh, Botswana is one of the clearest skied countries in the world. And not quite sure how this was measured, but you can see here that almost every day during uh, the southern winter uh, is clear or partially clear. And even in the wettest time of the year, in the southern summer, it's still clear for much of the time. Also, if you look at the, uh, the map of the whole world, looking at uh, where the street lights are and so on, you can see that the Northern Hemisphere and particularly Europe and the Eastern Seaboard of the United States are terrible for light pollution. But if you come down to Botswana, here's Johannesburg and so on, here's Cape Town. Botswana has almost no light pollution. It's almost totally dark. The interesting thing is, I mentioned the Tropic of Capricorn, which runs across here, runs through about half a dozen countries or so, one of which is Botswana. Only 3% of the world's population lives south of that, uh, the Tropic of Capricorn. And also in terms of geographical position, in uh, the middle of uh, the southern winter, the center of our galaxy, which is in the constellation of uh, Sagittarius, uh, comes right overhead. So it's one of the best places in the world to look at our galaxy. And this is just um, a schematic of our galaxy with the sun being out on uh, uh, about 30,000 light years from the center. The whole thing is rotating. It contains about 200,000 million stars altogether. And it's like two fried eggs back to back with a bulge in the middle uh, and a disc. We're sitting in the disc in the spiral arms. Um, and I uh, say the whole thing is rotating, taking about 200 million years or so to go around once. Um, so if we want to look into the center of the galaxy, I want to see what's going on there. Then, uh, and the Southern Hemisphere is also a spectacular place to see the Milky Way because you see, this is an all sky picture really, but uh, down here are the two Magellanic clouds which are um, companion galaxies, dwarf galaxies that, uh, that are companions of the Milky Way. Uh, you also see the dust lanes that uh, go across the Milky Way, which are very prominent in the Southern Hemisphere, because down there you can more readily see towards the center of our galaxy. And this video just uh, is uh, an animation when we start to look and see what's actually in the center of our galaxy. Uh, so this is put together by the European Southern Observatory and a collaboration of astronomers looking at what is going on right in the center. So we start the movie looking in the optical part of the spectrum. And then as we're looking through the dust clouds, we need to go into the infrared part of the spectrum. And you can see deeper into these otherwise obscured regions by looking in the infrared. We look deeper and deeper in. We're now beginning to see what is in the center of our galaxy, what everything is revolving around. And 
when this has been done, taking um, observations over a period of several years, we found that we could track stars as they orbited something in the middle of the galaxy. And uh, from this work, uh, Reinhard Gensel and uh, collaborators were able, and uh, astronomers in the US um, were able to uh, weigh the black hole that exists in the center of our galaxy. And they found it to be a mass that is a few million times the mass of the sun. And uh, uh, for that, those astronomers, including a woman astronomer in uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, were um, awarded the Nobel Prize for physics in this last uh, 12 months, which is uh, tremendous. So through those observations, we were able to weigh the, the object, investigate this mysterious black hole, supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, okay, so uh, a, an excellent place to do astronomy. Um, and I was a bit surprised when I first went to Botswana towards the end of 2017, that there wasn't an established astronomical society. Um, I gave a talk at the President's Hotel, which features in the number one ladies detective agency novels, which some of you may be familiar with, um, about the Star of Bethlehem, uh, the um, society, the uh, Southport Astronomical Society had a Star of Bethlehem talk, an excellent one from an old colleague of mine from University of Liverpool, Steve Barrett, uh, before Christmas. Uh, I gave my version of it in Haberoni and um, uh, got a, a very uh, receptive audience. And at the end of the talk, I said, it would be really good if there's an astronomical society here and anybody would be interested, then let's get together and see what we can do. And a bunch of enthusiasts and others, including Ian, who probably took this photograph, um, and others who are on the call now, um, gathered together, and the central photograph shows them, and a few uh, months later started a program of talks, and there's uh, the audience at one of the schools, Maripula School, <coughs> in Haberoni on the right-hand side, and, and uh, we came up with uh, a logo, um, which has the constellation of Capricorn um, as its symbol, very appropriately. Um, and then uh, through the auspices of the Southport Astronomical Society, and an old friend of mine, uh, John Barrow, and his wife Marjorie, who had a telescope that they would like to donate. Um, uh, through their efforts with the support of Southport and others in Haberoni, that telescope was shipped out and is now in the uh, possession and being used by the Astronomical Society of Botswana. It's actually at the Mokolodi uh, Nature Reserve, which is just outside Haberoni, and he is the <coughs> director of the reserve, together with Ian, um, about to cut the ribbon on the plaque, which mentions both the Barrows and Southport. And since then, there have been various uh, evenings of viewing where people have brought their own telescopes along to complement the society's telescope. And uh, I'm just very, very sorry that over the last 12 months, I've not been able to be there to be part of that. But I have been to events at Mokolodi before, and they've been really uh, fantastic. Um, the star parties organized by Harold Hester and his wife Geraldine have been superb there. Okay, so that's, and, and the society is going from strength to strength, uh, and it's a credit to everybody involved in that, that uh, all the work they're doing uh, with schools, uh, with the general public, <coughs> and also um, fostering ambitions like Botswana being part of the International Astronomical Union, which would be a great thing to be part of. So we go on to the uh, ambitions for the future. Just take a quick slurp. <clears throat> so I was very privileged to be part of formulating a national space science and technology strategy, which is just going through the works in uh, uh, in Botswana, uh, and that should be completed this year. 
Uh, the vision of that is for Botswana to be recognized as a leader among African nations in the development and application of space science and technology for the prosperity of all. <clears throat> um, and the various parts of this are satellite communications, space engineering. <clears throat> I should say that Botswana held a kickoff event for their own space satellite just before Christmas, and that project seems to be gathering a lot of momentum. It's very exciting indeed. Uh, led from Pust. I was on a call seven o'clock this morning actually to do with that uh, and it seems to be going extremely well. Uh, remote sensing from space which is very important for a country that's reliant on agriculture also for weather forecasting and uh, security and so on. Planetary science and on the call tonight I see that uh, Fulvio Franchi who's a lecturer at Bust, is on the call. He's given talks about the importance of Botswana as uh, a site or a place where we have planetary analog sites. For example, those of you who are familiar with photographs of the surface of Mars from the Mars rovers would be forgiven for thinking this was a picture of the surface of Mars. This is actually the Kalahari Desert. Also in the salt pans, which you can see on the image just uh, to the southeast of the Okavango Delta, these are extreme environments where scientists who are interested in the survival of life in extreme environments can conduct their experiments in analogs to other places in the solar system. <clears throat> so the planetary science part of the uh, strategy is very important. But I should all, but here I'm going to be talking about the astronomy and astrophysics. A backbone to all of that is the cyber in infrastructure for the nation to make all this possible and to do many other things in uh, research and education. But here I'll talk about the astronomy astrophysics and I'll talk about two particular components. First of all, the radio astronomy. And this is inspired by Botswana being a uh, one of the African partner countries to uh, South Africa in its pursuit of building the square kilometre array. And I'll say a lot more about that straight away, actually. Um, square kilometre array has its headquarters at Jodrell Bank, which is about I don't know, 40 minutes from here and probably about the same from Southport. Um, there are plans and in fact, there are ongoing developments putting telescopes in Australia and in Southern Africa. And these comprise two different types of radio receiver, the so-called uh, phased arrays, which are huge numbers of antennas, which are static. You can see very wide angles of the sky and you can form in images of the sky through very clever software and, and signal processing from those arrays working at low frequencies and then at higher frequencies conventional dishes working together as uh, very using very long baseline interferometry techniques or long baseline interferometry techniques. Um, in this case over the next um, decade it's planned to uh, put 130,000 uh, of the low frequency antennas mainly in Australia, and about 215 meter more conventional dishes uh, spreading out from uh, the Karoo in uh, the northern Karoo in South Africa. And it's that project, which is called SKA phase one, that uh, Botswana are initially uh, likely to be uh, part of, and I'll explain why in a minute. So, the main driver of the SKA, although it pushes the boundaries of technology in terms of the amount of data it will generate, which will be equivalent to the rest of the world's internet traffic put together, um, and also getting power to re remote places to have 24 hour power in places where you don't have any power cables, so it's storage of power from solar energy and things like that that are important, as well as all the technological spin offs. The main thing, of course, is the science. And the science ranges from extreme tests of uh, general relativity 
looking at the first stars and galaxies, looking how galaxies evolve through time, looking at the large scale structure of our universe, looking at magnetism across the universe, looking for life in terms of the building blocks of life or even signals from intelligent uh, life. And then almost as important is the fact that whenever you come up with a new facility, and this is by far the largest um, ground-based ground -based astronomy project ever, whenever you come up with a, a new facility exploring a new domain in terms of its sensitivity um, uh, combined with the resolution it will have, you find things that you never expected. And these are the really exciting things about science. So it has the broadest range of science of any facility worldwide. Just talk about one or two things. Uh, pulsars, these are uh, the remains of very massive stars that come to the ends of their lives, blow themselves to bits, except they don't quite blow themselves to bits. The, the core of the star collapses down to a point where a neutron star is formed. And um, the magnetic field that was in the star is, is compressed down. So the magnetic field strength at the surface of the neutron star is extremely high. And electrons spiral ar around those magnetic field lines coming out from the poles, you can see here, uh, emitting what's called synchrotron radiation. And if the star will be spinning, and if the beams point in your direction, every time the star rotates, you get a pulse all the way from uh, radio through to uh, x-rays and maybe beyond. Um, and these are incredibly accurate clocks. You can see the uncertainty, um, 10 to the minus 18th of a second uncertainty on the timing of this particular pulsar. Well, the SKA will detect all the pulsars in our Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy I was describing before, the one in which we sit. 30,000 normal pulsars, 2,000 millisecond pulsars. So you can imagine a star that contains more than twice the mass of the sun rotating in a millisecond or so. Yeah, it's incredible, incredible. Something that's just about 20 kilometers across. Um, rotating that fast. Um, it'll uh, find about 100 relativistic binaries. Um, it'll find pulsar black hole binaries and the first pulsars in the galactic center and the first pulsars outside our galaxy. It will perform tests of general rel relativity in uh, some of these extreme cases where you have a neutron star and a white dwarf, a neutron star, a neutron star, etc. And so it will be exploring fundamental physics. It will also um, explore the using pulsars and timing of pulsars, the way gravitational waves spread across the galaxy and disturb the signals that you see from uh, pulsars in some sort of systematic way. Anyhow, some fairly esoteric things, but very important and fundamental to uh, astrophysics and the whole of uh, science. A precursor to the uh, full SKA phase one is the Meerkat array, which was opened, inaugurated in the Karoo in South Africa, which I pointed to earlier on, uh, in July of 2019, I think it was. And some of the people who are on this call now were actually there. I know Greg Hillhouse, who's head of physics and astronomy at Bust, was there and some of the other uh, Bust people were at the inauguration. It's 64 dishes um, working together as one telescope to detect very sensitively and also to be able to precisely um, measure positions and discriminate uh, between objects that are very closely separated, if you like. So it's now become one of the world's pre premier radio observatories from nothing, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and the SKA, just uh, some facts and figures. It's uh, three sites. So there's the, uh, what's gonna be in Australia, what's being built in, in Africa, 
and then the headquarters is here at Jodrell Bank. One observatory that is now formally incorporated internationally. Um, they've, they're nearing the completion of the design phase. Phase one, which uh, uh, is um, part of that is expanding the meerkat array to 200 dishes or so. Uh, then phase two starts after phase one is completed and phase two is even more ambitious to put 2000 dishes uh, like the meerkat dishes are actually uh, slightly larger than the meerkat dishes across the whole of uh, Southern Africa. Um, and a major expansion of the SKA-1 low across Western Australia would be part of phase two. So how is Botswana involved in this? Well, South Africa um, was given the major role in development of the SKA, uh, partly because it um, brought in partner countries in Africa to try and make this a pan-African venture. And the way of doing that was through this project called the African Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, the AVN. So this is to place radio dishes or to convert radio dishes, existing telecommunications dishes into astronomy, uh, astronomical dishes um, across these partner countries. So nine partner countries, including South Africa, and uh, uh, Botswana is, is part of that collaboration. And Namibia and Botswana are after Ghana, who've already converted their um, 30 meter telecommunications dish to a radio astronomy dish. So Namibia and Botswana are next in line uh, to host a, a, a dish which will probably be one of the SKA-1 um, dishes um, on its soil. And this is in preparation for SKA phase two. But it means that Botswana would be able to take part in SKA phase one. And as part of the preparation for this, you want to train people up to be able to take part in that in a meaningful way and to gain skills in all the technologies that you need to take this forward. Um, so this is just a, a map which involves the human capital development and uh, astrophysics labs, which have already been set up in places like Bust, um, HPC, which exists at the University of Botswana, for example, but uh, is, uh, should be augmented in the future. Um, up through 2 dash interferometer, which is now, uh, is now used at Bust, exists and is being used at Bust uh, for student training. And then from 2017, when the Ghana dish was inaugurated to be fully part of the uh, AVN through their own radio dish. And this is what is being worked on now, together with the South Africans particularly, to provide Botswana with that radio edition, the capability to take a meaningful part in SKA as develops into this mega project towards the end of this decade. And ultimately for SKA phase two, there'll be 40 of these 15 meter dishes at each of three sites in Botswana, but not necessarily the same site as the AVN dish. The SKA dishes need to be somewhere that's even more radio quiet than where the AVN dish would go. Um, the AVN dish is it's almost like a proof of concept, um, uh, but will do important science and technology development in its own right. Just quickly skip on to uh, another project that's a radio project that um, uh, Buster are involved in. It's the hydrogen intensity in real time analysis experiment. This is linked to the um, SKA in terms of uh, the sort of data handling and uh, some of the technologies involved and uh, the science as well. It comprises 1,024 six meter dishes, which are being de deployed in the Karoo, mainly probing the evolution of the structure of the universe and therefore looking at how dark energy 
might evolve with time. You get an idea of the size of an individual dish there. Um, and as well as putting dishes in the Karoo, uh, they wish to put a few dishes at large distances to act as an, uh, an interferometer to pinpoint the sources more accurately, because the longer the baseline, the more accurately you can pinpoint the position of a source um, uh, of particular types of objects. And one of the most interesting types of object they wish to explore are the uh, fast radio bursts, which were discovered uh, about um, 2007, thereabouts. <clears throat> and at first, in fact, for many years, have been very controversial in terms of their origin. Um, one or two of them were shown to be just the opening and closing of the door of a microwave oven at the um, radio telescope, um, uh, where they were being observed. But certainly, most of them now are known to be uh, real radio sources in the cosmos. And in more recent times, we've been able to localize where some of those bursts are coming from. And it seems that um, these bursts can be, some of them at least, maybe the majority, are at cosmological distances. In other words, at very large distances, the distances of external galaxies, uh, large distances. And because there are those large distances, but we can still see them. They must be in, emitting an awful lot of energy. They're emitting this particular burst uh, that's shown on the left-hand side here uh, in, was lasting a few milliseconds, but emitting 500 million times the sun's energy output in that uh, period of time. And we think that they are probably associated, although there are several theories still, they may be associated with uh, stars that are um, the results of collisions between neutron stars forming magnetars. So these are stars with even higher magnetic fields than pulsars, a thousand times greater than a normal pulsar, for example, um, and uh, giving out huge bursts of energy. Uh, so there are changes in, the in that magnetic field. Anyway, um, so optical astronomy, um, part of the plan is to develop a national optical observatory in conjunction with the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand, which is called NARIT. And I've had the, the honor to be associated with Thailand for probably the last 15 years. For the last seven or eight years, I've chaired their uh, International Science Advisory Committee, and that's meant at least annual visits to Thailand, which are, are always a great pleasure to see how they're developing. And they've come from, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, they've come from almost nothing to develop a fantastic astronomy, astrophysics and space program. They have um, regional public observatories across the country at uh, five locations. Um, they are based in Chiang Mai up here in the north. They have just finished building a 40 meter radio telescope uh, near to their headquarters in Chiang Mai. Um, they run the national optical observatory, which is a 2.5 meter telescope in the highest, on the highest mountain in Thailand, again, near Chiang Mai. And they're just great people to work with. Uh, just give a, 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 an advert here. There's a talk on the 25th of February by the director of NARIT, uh, Saran Poshichindra on uh, uh, NARIT and uh, the ASB will be advertising that in due course. Anyway, the Thais have developed this, for example, and this is just one of their regional public observatories. In the dome here is a one meter class telescope. And then on the observing floor out here are smaller telescopes for public and student use. There's a big uh, outdoor auditorium. There's also a planetarium. And this is my uh, colleague, Greg Hillhouse, who's on the call tonight. I mentioned Greg earlier on. Uh, here's Saran Poshichinda um, taking Greg through the, uh, the telescopes here, which are used for public use. Um, these regional public observatories get 
around 100,000 visitors a year each in Thailand. Um, and uh, it's amazing the work that they do with uh, schools and with the general public, as well as for professional research, because, and here's the outside of the planetarium. Um, this is just something in their professional research portfolio. They have a, uh, a set of telescopes, robotic telescopes around the world in these locations that they use together to form a network. And really you want these to be placed in longitude and latitude so that you cover um, at any given time, at least one of your telescopes is in uh, darkness and is in the right hemisphere. Um, so, and it's likely to be at a clear site. So you need to, to increase the number of telescopes and you see that oh, yeah. this line of longitude here has none of their telescopes. And that line of longitude is where you want to put at least one more telescope, if not two. And Botswana is right on that line. Um, so mm -hmm. the Thais are very interested in helping Botswana to develop a national public observatory a national optical observatory with a research telescope. So the impact of the uh, observatory would be on schools and the general public, including tourists, amateur astronomers, including the ASB, of course, undergraduates at the universities and advanced research projects. And these research projects very quickly would encompass things like searching for and observing planets around other stars, and this is just um, showing how a planet crossing the face of a star causes a dip in light. And <clears throat> the first of these so-called transiting exoplanets was discovered with a telescope that had an aperture of only about eight inches. So uh, small telescopes can do this. Um, observations of uh, novae, which is my own area and supernovae. This just shows the light curve, so-called light curve uh, of a nova, in this case, coming up here in galaxy M31. And looking for, more ambitiously, think for optical counterparts of the fast radio bursts that the telescopes, that the Hyrax telescope, for example, will discover, and possibly, although it's a lot more speculative, the optical counterparts of gravitational wave sources where you're seeing the final death throes of merging uh, neutron stars, for example. Okay, so what about um, practical issues such as time scales and costs? If we started now, and this includes all the operations for the following five years, the Hyrax node, the figures here are given in poolers, but for the UK audience, these are given in pounds. Uh, it's about 400,000 pounds, of which 100,000 pounds comes in from uh, UKZN, University of KwaZulu-Natal, which are the project leaders on Hyrax. The full National Observ Optical Observatory be up and running within two years. And all that kit, including the planetarium, which would be central to the public outreach side of it, would uh, cost about 2.1 million pounds. The AVN dish, where most of the uh, funding would come from South Africa in terms of the dish itself and all the, uh, the back end, electronics, computing, etc. And Botswana would do the site preparation <coughs> and the operations. That would be operational by 2025, uh, cost about 5.4 million pounds from Botswana. And the total cost for astronomy and the strategy, which includes hiring the additional staff to exploit the science and run the degrees at um, university uh, would be about nine million pounds. So just to put that in context, and I was some time ago uh, thinking of how I could put that in context, as I traveled to Botswana on an A350, I just wondered what that, uh, what that relates to in terms of an aircraft. So here's the cost of astronomy in the space science strategy at nine million pounds. One engine on that A350 cost 24.7 million pounds. So probably the whole of the space science and technology strategy of Botswana could be funded for the cost of one engine on an A350. That sort of made me think about uh, the relative cost of these things.
Um, okay, so finally, uh, some conclusions. Botswana is a beautiful country and a very safe country to visit. Spectacular wildlife and, and lovely people. Um, and in normal times, it's relatively easy to get to. Somebody on uh, the talk in November from Steve Barrett asked the question about getting there and said it looked quite quite lengthy and difficult. Depends which way you go. <clears throat> um, Ethiopian Airlines, for example, uh, now or have until recently, I suppose they'll start it again, started flights into Manchester and from Manchester you can link up to uh, Addis Ababa and there's a flight from Addis Ababa to Haberoni which touches down at Victoria Falls and is a very quick and was an inexpensive route for somebody from the UK. Otherwise it's going through Johannesburg for example for most, uh, most flights but there are lots of different ways to get there. Um, clear dark skies, for optical astronomy, it's radio quiet, and it's very extensive flat planes for future radio astronomy projects like the SKA. Um, the formation of the Astronomical Society there has been a watershed, <clears throat> and the partnership with Southport has already proved extremely fruitful. Um, sharing these talks, sharing experiences with websites and so on, um, also the, the funding that uh, Southport so very generously put together to enable us to uh, take uh, John and Marjorie's telescope to South Africa. Uh, it's already been, to uh, Botswana, it's already been uh, extremely fruitful. And the future plans for astronomy within the uh, strategy promise great rewards for Botswana, which go far beyond astronomy itself. So very briefly, it would develop, it would deliver both the AVN and Hyrax projects, and enable participation in SKA phases one and two, you build the National Optical Observatory and Planetarium. This would give everything from outreach programs, higher tourist offerings to participation in international research projects. Would lead to new undergraduate, postgraduate degree programs and serve as an inspiration to young uh, people in Botswana to study STEM subjects. And then finally, it would stimulate technical industry and innovation, create at the minimum around 70 permanent high skilled jobs in the country. <clears throat> However, at the moment, I'm just very, very sad that I have to be here in, uh, as Rick was saying, and people were saying it on as a, a rainy and cold <coughs> UK, when I would love to be uh, in the uh, Southern Hemisphere in Botswana with my old friends there and colleagues. Um, the day will come, but I take some heart from the fact that um, while I was in Botswana, I, I joined uh, through Harold Hester and uh, also through Ian White, who was the custodian of the building, the, the place I lived in, Haberoni, who's a great wildlife photographer, from the fact that <clears throat> I've been following the nesting of our swallows, our barn swallows, here in the UK in my home in Cheshire for the last 20 years, noting their return and noting when they leave to go south coming back every year to nest in our stables. And those swallows, the same European barn swallows, are at the moment in Botswana. And here's a photograph taken by uh, Ian White of barn swallows in Haberoni. And in the next month, those barn swallows will be heading back north here to nest. And I hope by the time they're taking their youngsters south, um, for the southern summer and the northern winter we'll be able to travel again and I'll be able to uh, travel again to Botswana. But with that I'd just uh, like to say thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll uh, <laughs> take any, any questions. Thank you. Mike, first of all, um, I'd like to, uh, people can unmute, uh, unmute themselves, I guess, if you want to have a discussion. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Mike for a very interesting talk. Um, I must confess, I didn't know a great deal about Botswana, but from what I've seen from the photographs and the descriptions that uh, Mike has given, it, it suddenly becomes a very appealing place to visit with its uh, warm, warm weather and 
fairly dry, sunny weather. Um, so uh, it has a, attractions compared with the UK at the moment, <laughs> I have to say. Yeah, so I thank Mike for that yeah, insight yeah. into the country and also for the uh, very interesting uh, aspects of astronomy, particularly the upcoming radio astronomy, the developments of it, which look as though they're, they're going to really probe some very extreme physics and reveal hopefully some very interesting things. So um, uh, if anyone has got some questions to ask, please feel free to fire away. I see Patrick. Uh, Patrick, yeah. Hi, Patrick. You go Hi. on. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mike, that was fascinating. I mean, it's, Thank you. It's, it's amazing what um, the, the, the advancements and the leaps in both Botswana and Thailand. I mean, mm. it puts the, uh, the UK to shame, really especially in the public outreach, it's just fantastic. What I'm curious about is, um, was Meerkat at all involved in the discovery of the odd radio circles a few months ago? Because mm -hmm. I believe there was a, something to do with the Australian observatories discovered them, but I was wondering if any of the African ones were involved at all as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. I don't know for sure they were. There may be others on this call who do know the answer to that, but um, I uh, I hadn't seen anything directly from Meerkat on that. But um, yeah, um, but it's certainly, as I said, it's it is one of the world's premier um, radio observatories now, um, and South Africa itself has come a huge, long way in the last ten to twenty years in uh, in astronomy. And they're very, very enthusiastic about it in terms of the way it can enthuse its young people about the study of science and technology, how it actually pushes the boundaries of technology mm -hmm. and leads to developments of all sorts of things. We, we all know that um, Wi-Fi um, has developed from uh, radio astronomy and uh, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can... Uh, think of lots and lots of examples of things that have developed from this very esoteric science that actually, uh, you know, medical imaging and all these sort of applications that uh, have spun off from it. So, yeah. I should also say that um, Thailand, uh, this International Science Advisory uh, Committee that I, I chair, um, uh, uh, determined, I think it was two years ago now, that Thailand has the world's top public outreach program, bar none. They have put um, small telescopes into hundreds of schools in Thailand, together with the training packs and access to the training. Not only that, they built those telescopes in Thailand, which they'd never done before. So you know, it's amazing. Amazing. And now they are developing their own space satellite as well, as Botswana is actually, but a, a year or two behind Thailand. So, What's the name of 